Okay. All right. Let's turn to 2 Timothy 3.15, and this is the passage we're going to stay in for my little portion. Um, I'm going to give you the intellectual reasons and whatnot for teaching children, and then Lori and Kathy get to come give you the fun stuff. (laughs) But I have to tell you that this is the um, verse that I use in my preschool. I teach um, at a Christian preschool, have for the last 13 years. Um, I teach age three. We have uh, seven classrooms of three-year-olds. I have a staff of uh, 14, and uh, we are teaching them scripture along with their phonics and everything else. So if you want to, if you're a homeschooling mom and you have a three-year-old and you want to talk about a phonics workbook that I wrote, Lori has one. She can hold it up and show you. But anyway, um, I do, I have written that curriculum as well. Um, but let's start with, uh, 14, I'm going to start in 14, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the Holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now that passage is the theme of my preschool, the theme of my Sunday school class. Um, I want to tell you a conversation that took place in my Sunday school class in December. Uh, Girl A says, my daddy and I played a game last night and daddy cheated. And girl B thought about that and she said, well, your daddy's a sinner. So he could do that. Don't you remember about Adam and Eve when we learned about that? They sinned and everyone became a sinner. So your daddy's a sinner too. And I thought, way to go. (laughs) That was between a four and a five-year-old, that conversation. So we were able to go from there to talk about, okay, now what's the solution to sin? We didn't just end it there that daddy's a sinner because we're all sinners. So we had to go on to say, but Christ died for our sins and rose again and was given to us as our savior as a free gift that salvation comes to those who believe and so they were of course they knew this they've been in class they know this they know the words they know what to say they know how that is why because we talk about it all the time and the key to this age group is repetition Um, children build up memories from the experiences and instruction received from parents teachers grandparents everybody around them They know and want to do what is right. They want to please you. That's what they naturally want to do. And of course, they don't always because, as the girl said, we're all born sinners. So sometimes we mess up. But to have a parent then show us the right way and to forgive us sets the example of how Christ forgave you and I. So that's an important example for us to... to, um, to show to them. Now, children optimally are having their brains formed between the ages of zero to six. They are growing tremendously, the brain itself, between the ages of zero months and and six years of age. A huge, huge leap in brain growth happens between age two and three. In fact, because it is such a key time of cognitive, emotional, and intellectual growth, many groups throughout um, history have targeted this age group. Some have even exploited this age group because the knowledge gained at this key time in their lives will be absorbed best and will stay with them the longest. And I would give you the example of my mother-in-law who has severe dementia and lives in about six to seven to eight years of age. She has all those memories of what she learned in school, what she learned in home, where she was living. In fact, if you ask her where she's living now, she'll tell you she lives in Argentina. That's where she was when she was that age. So those memories are still there, even though everything else has been robbed from her brain. So it tells you what you're learning at that age is key and will stick with you. Proverbs 22, 6 tells us to train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. I have, um, in my preschool class this year, we had a class of 11, and in our class, we have all different faiths. Uh, Probably the majority are Hindu, and I'm in a Christian school, but that's just how it is. And we have children who speak Malayalam, who speak Telugu, Tamil. We have people who speak... um, 
uh, Romanian, we have people who speak Polish, we have people who speak Korean and um, Mandarin, once in a great while Cantonese, but mostly Mandarin. And these children come in, a lot of them without any English. Kathy Wooters and I both teach together. She's my uh, co-teacher in that class. And um, they're coming from different religious, cultural, and uh, uh, speech backgrounds, okay? And when we come in from gym every day, I have them lay down and we play quiet music. Quiet music time, you lay down, you rest, you just listen. And we play a medley of It Is Well With My Soul and Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. And do you know in two <coughs> months from the start of school, some of those kids who speak no English are singing those two songs. They don't get the words all right. <laughs> we get some pretty funny versions of it. <laughs> so then we start telling them what the words are so that we hope they'll get them a little bit right. But in their minds, they have absorbed through music two very key songs in our faith just by repetition and listening day after day for a, not even five minutes. It's a five-minute song after gym every day but they can sing it. Um, we are teaching them English, obviously, but we're also teaching them the Holy Scriptures. And how are we doing that? Repetition. <laughs> Songs, stories from the Bible, games, crafts, conversations every day about, you know, look at this and what are we talking about and what are we learning about and how did God have a part in that? And we'll just bring that in every day with what we do. Um, and, you know... That's the same way your kids are learning all the Disney songs. <laughs> That's how they're learning the Paw Patrol. They're doing it by repetition, by music, by visual CDs and things like that. Um, in 30 plus years of teaching Sunday school, I have had some parents tell me their children are too young to understand or memorize Bible verses. And all I can say is really? Because <laughs> I can tell you a two-year-old who can tell me every one of the superheroes and who can name all the Paw Patrol guys, and who can tell me all his favorite Bible stories, and knows exactly what they're about. And he's not even three. So don't tell me your three, four, five, six, seven, eight-year-old can't do better than that, because they can, unless they obviously have a serious, I, I, I know I'm getting a little feedback, um, unless they have a serious um, issue with you know learning. I mean, obviously, we have some kids who have learning disabilities and are unable to do that at the same level as everybody else. But if your child has no learning disabilities and nothing to prevent them, they can learn the scriptures. They can learn the verses. Is it because I'm by that? Yeah, I didn't think about that. Again, repetition. Hearing the songs on CD, radio, and conversations are what makes those children remember those things that they know. We want to do the same thing with God's word. We want to play those songs on our TVs. We want to play those songs on our um, car CD players. We want to talk about those stories. We want to talk about those things as you are just doing life. Um, Ephesians 6, 4 says... And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And who shall we teach? And what shall we teach them? Or how shall we teach them? Isaiah 28, 9 to 10 says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. They're talking about teaching your baby Okay, just weaned, not too soon. You could start reading them the Bible stories before they're weaned, obviously. It's good to have that visual, you know, show them the pictures, let them hear it. But, you know, that's the time to teach them. And, of course, Deuteronomy 6, 6 to 7 says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them, teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Pretty much all day we should be drawing their attention to the Lord. Now, teaching children the word of God is the only way to prepare them to make the most important decision of their lives. Where will they spend eternity? Children are very trusting. Am I still by him? Sorry. Children are very trusting by nature and will believe what you tell them, whether it's fairy tales or truth. Ask a child about the tooth fairy. They'll swear it's true because you told them it's true. 
we want them to know that God's word is true. Building Bible knowledge into them does not guarantee their salvation. You and I know that's an individual willful choice we have to make at some point in our lives. But without those tools to make that decision, it's impossible for them to get saved. So they have to know what the gospel is in order to be able to believe it at some point in their lives. And there is a way to teach children and help them mature through the spiritual growth process. And that's on the sheet I gave you. You should have this chart about individual development. Did you get one of these? Okay, sorry, not everyone got one. If you didn't get one, raise your hand and I'll make sure you get one. Okay. Sure. Hold on, let me grab more. Okay, yeah, do you want to give one to Laura over there? Okay, so there is a way to teach, and I took this through um, 2 Timothy 3.15 through 17. Um, The first stage is the zero to three age, and that's where they start to get symbolic thought, vocabulary starting. They have two to three word sentences possible. Um, They are manipulating objects and things. They're very concrete. They're very egocentric in their thinking. They think about themselves, me first, obviously. And this is the age you want to teach them the facts. You want them to learn the who, the what, the where, and the when. They're too young for the why. They need to know just the facts. The way we do that, simple Bible stories repeated often. Bible character toys can be used to act out stories, naming events, people and objects in the Bible, singing Bible songs. Again, constantly reminding them that what's in the Bible is true. It's not a fairy tale. Age three to seven, you start teaching the spiritual truths, that scripture has a deeper deeper meaning. Vocabulary is growing a lot. The children can converse. They can use imaginative play. Symbolic thinking takes off and matures. This is where you do Bible stories, songs, crafts, acting out the stories, pointing out spiritual aspects of the story. And then I I just went up to age 11. I wasn't thinking about any high schoolers or anything, but anyway. Um, Children can reason logically about events at this age, and they can understand other points of view and can determine what the story characters are thinking and feeling. So this is where you want to do more role-playing Bible events. You want to do plays. You want to do crafts and music, conversations about the lesson, pointing out how to apply it to the child's everyday life and events. So on the other side of your chart, you have my little house. And I know I'm just kind of going through this fast because we, this is kind of a synopsis of a lesson I did this year for our ladies meeting, but I just uh, don't want to take all the time. Um, Here's our foundation of our house. So obviously you're looking at the bottom on the other side of the page at the bottom up. Okay. And at the youngest stage, we are teaching them the facts and that they're not make believe. This is a foundation we have to set up from very young in their lives. Remember that from a child, thou hast known the Holy Scriptures that make thee wise unto salvation. Now, wise unto salvation is the key words there because every person of every age needs to start there. If you don't know salvation, no matter what age you are, you can't grow beyond that. So you have to have the gospel. Um, How to get saved is the first fact to be learned and the first step in learning. Faith in Jesus Christ is the key to building the rest of the building. And who is the wise master builder upon whom this building is built? Is it Adam? Is it Moses? Matthew? John? No. Uh, I'm not going to look it up today, but you can write down 1 Corinthians 3.10. It is Paul who laid the foundation of the grace dispensation and upon whose foundation we must build. Children can learn who their apostle is and what the dispensation of grace is at this age group. They do it in my class. Then I'm going to put up the house. These are the spiritual truths. 2 Timothy 3.16 says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Who is Paul saying that to? 
He's saying it to Timothy. 2 Timothy 1, 2 tells you that. It is Timothy who from a child has known the Holy Scriptures. How did he learn them? His mother and his grandmother. Sorry, Grandpa, there was no Grandpa there that we know of. <laughs> but that's okay. You're part of the key there too. Helping grasp children, um, helping children grasp the meaning and truth about the passage nurtures their relationship to God and leads to life and godliness. Spiritual truths can be taught from preschool on up. And then as they get older, they can start to learn the application. 2 Timothy 3.17 says that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. From about age seven to eight, children are developing a spiritual awareness and a growing consciousness of right and wrong. Used in a sinful way, of course, we have lots of issues with them. But we want to teach them the non-sinful way to react at this age. This is the age where it's very important to take those spiritual truths and apply it to direct things in their lives, to make it real, to make a situation in their life um, to understand how that scripture would actually go to that situation and how they would deal with that situation or that um, you know, incident in their lives by using the scriptures. Um, we want the application of the written word to help make it the living word because that will change them and lead them to life in Christ. <laughs> Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. At this stage, as the Bible story is being read, it's important to ask questions in the middle of the story. Like, you know, here's a situation. Um, how would you react? How would you feel if you were that guy? How would, you be, uh, how would you have dealt with it? What do you think God would want you to do in that situation? Those are things you can bring in in the middle of the story so it starts bringing the story more to them and to what could happen in their lives. Um, if you wait till the end of the story to do that, it's a mistake because at the end their attention's already switched off. They know it's the end. They're thinking church is almost over. We're done. We're gone. You know, they're already, you know how it is. If you're in a church and the pastor starts to give the gospel, start hearing. Everyone's done. We're not hearing anymore because we know this is the end. We've come to the end. We know this is it. We're over. Well, children will do that in a lesson. At the end, they're like, okay, she's done brain is off. <laughs> so ask those things right in the middle, all during the story, so that it's a constant part of the teaching that you're doing. Um, so for example, when reading the story of Daniel and the lions during the story, stop and ask, why did Daniel defy the king? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Would you do the same? Is it good that he did that or isn't it good? Why? How would you feel when facing the lions? Would you have trusted God to save you if you were there at that time? Those are the kind of things that can bring that story home to them. And at this age, it's important to do that. So what can you do? Read children Bible stories from a very young age. Teach them salvation verses to memorize. They can learn the Romans road, if you know what that is the Romans verses to salvation. Our preschool does it. They all say it on stage at the end of the year for their parents. Teach them songs they can sing. You can sing verses like Christ died for our sins. Jesus loves me. All those you know, famous Bible songs that we know, they can learn all that. They love songs. Play songs during quiet music times or on car rides that will stay with them. Take time to answer their questions, even if it seems to be a little over their heads. I had a four-year-old Hindu boy who asked his dad, who then came and asked me, how come I can't see God? Where is he? Why isn't he here where I can see him? Great questions. So I answered the dad. The dad told the kid. So the dad got to hear it, and the kid got to hear it, which is a good double whammy there. But they have good questions. Take them seriously. Give them good and true answers. Even if it's a little bit over their heads, it still puts some information in their heads that they will retain. And maybe when they'll hear it again later, it'll come to mind that, oh, yeah, I've already heard this a little bit. Yeah, okay, now that makes sense. I've heard that before. Remember that repetition and familiarity are the key to retention. Thank you.
right, good afternoon. All right, I'm here to teach how to teach visually. So we're going to have group participation. You don't have to talk, <laughs> but you're going to help me. Everybody's going, whew, okay, I don't have to talk. <laughs> but you're going to help me because we're going to look at five verses. They've got a lot of doctrine in them. So you might look at it and say, you know what, that's a lot for kids to learn, but we're going to do it visually. And it's amazing how we, can, we all learn visually. But I'm going to start out with visual learning. Visual learning is a teaching and a learning style in which ideas, concepts, data, and other information are associated with images and techniques, making it simple, making words come alive. Visual learning from infant starts in the womb from 18 years old. That gray matter starts to form, and the visual cortex is connected to that. So that starts before they're even born. From the ages of three to eight, visual learning improves and begins to take on many different forms. I never had thought about this. Toddlers from the ages of three to eight, visual learning improves and begins to take many different forms. Toddlers using, are using newly developed sensory motor skills to understand the world around them. Have you ever noticed, and I never thought about this, toddlers, and I work with three-year-olds, they put pop objects really close up to your face and their face. They go, oh, here, look at this. And they put it like <laughs> two inches from your face, and you're like pushing it away. Um, they look at things up close, and they block everything out around them because it's, it's the, their visual learning is it, they take it in right here. Now, as adults, of course, we're taller. We walk into a room. We don't look at something right in front of us. We scan the whole room. So visually, little children, they're starting to learn. That's how they learn. They learn by what's up close and, and touching things. The ages of 4 to 11, the child's visual learning can now be applied to formal learning focused towards books and reading rather than just physical objects. From the ages of 9 to 14, visual learning engages students, and student engagement is one of the most important factors that motivates students to learn. Visual aids help to increase students' ability to learn and increase students' interest. I know that's really big for me. <laughs> um, it has been found that students pay greater attention to lecture material when visuals are used. And I think that's even, I would agree with for adults also. Um, they are more likely to remember information that is learned with a visual aid, which I said, which is true of, I think, all ages. Boys and girls generally learn differently. Young adult males demonstrate a preference for learning through activities and that they are able to manipulate, and young adult females show a greater performance for learning through teacher explanation and direction through reading. Now, that's not true of all children, but I guess that is more typical. Some people are really book learners. Some people are strictly visual learners, and some are both. But everybody can learn visually. So... We're going to look at the verses, if you want to have you, if you have your Bibles, and we're going to look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. And I'm just going to quickly read through these verses. Then we're going to take and we're going to reread these verses, and we're going to put it all visual up here. And you're going to help me. That's why all of you have artwork. So when I ask for a piece of artwork, I want you to bring it up, and we're going to put it on the different signs according to the different verses so that we can take these more difficult verses, and when you make it visual, the children can remember it, and it's something that it, it makes it um, easy for them to learn. All right, so 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 5. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall heap to themselves teachers and have itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of the evangelist, and make full proof of thy ministry. So now we're going to make it come alive. All right? So I charge thee. Who has the sign that says, and this is verse 1, charge thee. Got to look at your little artwork in front of you. Okay, can you come on? And every, everything should have a piece of duct tape behind it. And come on up and put that on the, the board for verse 1. All right, 
Now, the next part of the verse says, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge, who has judged, shall judge. All right, bring up judge. Put it on verse one. And the quick, who has quick. Now, I, this is just a very quick version of everything. You can obviously go in and explain things in more greater detail. But for the, you know, I taught this to the ladies Bible study. This is how I taught it because I'm going to reuse this for the children. Um, verse one. Yep. And the dead. Who has the dead? If you notice the colors, look at the colors too that we're coordinating. The dead. At his appearing essence and his kingdom. Now, we're going to do verse number two. This will be verse number two. All right. Everybody get your pom-poms and your little hands. And if you've got a little shouty thing, because we're going to say, preach the word. Everybody. Preach the word. Oh, a little louder. Preach the word. All right. Very good. So, <laughs> what's the word? All right. We're going to look at 2 Timothy 2.15. Who has that? 2 Timothy 2.15. Bring it on up. We're going to put it on, on uh, verse number two. All right, which we know is study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In a nutshell, what is rightly dividing the word of truth? This is how I think visually. And I know not everybody thinks visually. I've had people say to me, I don't think visually. So some people, it comes more natural. Um, I know sometimes when I wrote Sunday School material, and I, Lori can attest to this, I would be thinking about things and then just be on the expressway and pass by the exit <laughs> and then go, oh, now i got to turn around and I'm a little lost. But, you know, your mind gets going. So, um, in eternity past, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit designed a plan for Jesus Christ to reign over both heaven and earth. Two agencies to occupy two realms, both under the headship of Jesus Christ. So I was trying to think, how can I get that across to the kids visually? So I thought about, um, you want to represent the two agencies and their destination. So I kept thinking, destination, destination, destination. Okay, destination. So in your mind, think of something when you think of destination. So in my mind, in my mind, this is what I thought. A train. A train is, has a specific purpose. It's to get a group of people from one destination to another. It has a specific destination on a specific track. And in order to board the train, you need a ticket to get on the train, which says that you've been paid in full. This agency or train, train was prophesied in advance since the world began. And we looked at Acts chapter uh, 3, verse 21 whom the heaven must receive until the time of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his prophets since the world began. The conductor of this train, of course, is Jesus Christ. Those on the train are believing Israel. The destination will be the earth. The overseer of this train is Peter and the 12 tribes of Israel. And to get on the ticket, you must trust in the promised Messiah. So that's Israel's train. The other nations to get on that board had to access God through the nation of Israel. And the books of that for that are, are Matthew, the Old Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and part of Acts. And then the books for Israel in the future, obviously Hebrews through Revelation. Israel's train has been temporarily stopped. The station is closed, not forever, but for a season. The other agency was kept secret, a mystery before the world began. And you can talk about a mystery. What is a mystery? Now, that, that can be a whole you know, lesson in itself. Romans 16, 25. Now, to him that is the power to establish you according to my gospel, according to the revelation of the mystery, was kept secret since the world began. Ooh, now we pull apart Israel. She's temporarily been, been set aside. And we pull apart, and I think I, part of my little train fell down here. But <laughs> I had great big mar mar white marker boards that I did this at church, so it was a little bit easier. And we reveal, and I have one that needs to go there that says through. But here is the train for the body of Christ. And the conductor of that train, of course, is Jesus Christ. 
those on the train are the body of Christ and those who trusted, those who trust in the in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day. The destination is the heavenlies and the overseer of this train is Apostle Paul and the ticket to get on this train is to, is to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross. All are welcome, not through the law nor through Israel. On this train, all are called the body of Christ. And the books for that are Romans through Philemon. So then, of course, we were taught we would talk about which train is in operation today. Now, um, I would like someone to bring up every word of God is truth. But trying to apply the instructions given to another agency undermines and distorts the word of God. Who has, it's a sheet with a bunch of letters on it, and it's kind of hard to read. It's a great big sheet. Okay, bring that on up and put that on verse 2. I'm not going to tell you what it says, but it looks very confusing. (laughs) <laughs> and life, you know what? When we don't rightly divide God's word, and we've seen this over and over again, life decisions are made sometimes with disastrous results. Simply because God's plan for these two agencies and their designs are not clearly understood. So you can sit and look at that and try and figure out what it is. So now we're going to go on. We're going to continue on verse 2. We're going to stay on this, and it says, In season. Who has in season? In season. Bring in season. <laughs> now, I, you, this is what I talk about with color. What do you think of when you think of, of, of something in season? What color do you think of? Green. Green. Okay, who has out of season? Who has out of season? Okay, what do you think of when you think of out of season? Yeah. What do you think of when you, what color do you think of when you think of out of season? Brown. 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 Okay, those are the things when you do a Sunday school lesson, you, can, you, put, you put color to it. Um, reprove. Reprove. Who has the flashlight? You got it? Well, I've got the, the words. Okay, bring it on up. <laughs> and then when you take those words, you can explain it. So you have something visual that makes them, that, that connects it. And then you take that, wor- that, that word and then explain it. And I'm going to put it right over here, somewhere over here. We're getting, I know we're getting kind of mushed here. So then here we have the light of God's word. So when you think light. What do you think of? And you just, you take it from there. Um, rebuke. Who has rebuke? Bring it on up. To stand firm with the truth. Now, you can have the kids stand up and stand firm, you know, and do a, do a game with that. Take it and make a game out of that. Um, so, you know, something like this that is five verses long can be a, end up being a three-month class if you take and add games and so on and so forth. So we've got rebuke. Exhort. Who has exhort? Verse 2 has a lot of things in it. And on that, we did the definition on that word was to give strength and to advise and to edify. Now you can go into those words and explain those further. And then it, it, you just, it, sometimes you just have to sit and think. It's not always going to pop into your head immediately, especially if you don't think that way. But even for me, Sometimes it'll take me two or three days when I was thinking of the train and I kind of had an idea and I took it from there and then that didn't really work and then I tried something else and then all of a sudden it started to come together. With all long suffering. Who has long suffering? All right. And then we have on there all the things with long suffering. Patience, forbearing, love, joy, gentleness, peace, kindness. That can be a whole week just in itself to go over those. Now this actually could end up being like a six month material you know like i said we we're going to do this in a month but this could be expanded I, this is just the beginning of this and doctrine who has doctrine all right and those faithful words taught to reprove correction instruction and in righteousness sound all right now we're going to move on to verse three and i'm going to read that verse for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but after their own lust shall heap them to sell, heap to themselves, having itching ears. Who has all the ears? <laughs> they look like kidneys, I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm creative, but I'm not the best drawer. So bring the ears. Everybody bring the ears up and put the ears on verse number th- on verse, uh, board number three. <laughs> I tried. That one I really had a hard time with, but <laughs> it was, we had a good laugh. <laughs> So we have itching ears. 
We have doctrines that condone their own lifestyle. We have a resurrection that is already passed. So I crinkle, crinkled it up because it's already passed, something old that you've like, you know, it's already gone. Human viewpoint, all wrapped up. So when you think of something wrapped up, you think of a, a present, a gift. So we put it in there. And human thinking. See how I did the human thinking? You can even take and how you write the words that, that um, all kind of skewed, you know, with human thinking. All right, verse number four. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall be turned into fables. So what do you think when you think of fables? We got some books out there. Who has the fable books? Can you everybody bring up the fable books? We got about, I think we got about three or four of them. A fable, so what is a fable? So when I think of a fable, I think of like little books. Because you think of, you know, stories, how we, we tell our children little, you know, fairy tale stories and so on. They're in little books. So a fable. So a story, a fable is a story that teaches moral truth, but not doctrinally correct. So it's, you know, religious activity, religious superstition, supernatural experiences that can't be explained. Uh, that one, if you've got little older kids, that's a great one to teach them because so much of that is, uh, you know, even the, even saved and unsaved in that, in that world. Um, putting yourself back under the law. Um, all right. Now we're going to look at the saved and the unsaved by nature is drawn to a set of rules in which they measure themselves. And that's for both, but in different ways. All right. The law is like a ball and chain. So um, bring up the chain who has, who has, um, oh, I had unsaved with it. But on it, it says being good, giving money, a chain. So when you think of a chain, all right, we got the one that says being good and there's, there's two chains. Being good and uh, giving money. Is that the one? Is he turn it over? And Okay, that's the unsafe chain. So we just made a literal chain because you think of a ball and chain. And then I just put on there being good, giving enough money, helping others, the scale system. That's the law, what that does for the unsafe person. It puts them under a work system. But even as for believers, who has the chain that has, um, we're, that's going to be for the believer. That's our other chain. Bring our other chain up. And you can put that underneath the, un, the saved. Um, as believers, the law, even though we're dead to the law, our sinful nature grapples with this. Our service is self-based at times. Our own expectations are not met. We beat ourselves down. And motivation to, self, to serve is sometimes self-centered. So that's the chain for the, the saved individual. But as believers, we're a new creature in Christ. Who has the butterfly? And that's, uh, we're made righteous, Christ in you. Now, this could be a whole month of lessons right there. Made righteous, Christ in you, give thanks, made alive. We are freed from the chains of law and sin. So now they have that visual. They see the chains. We're freed from that and the butterfly. And our last verse um, which is, but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. When I taught for the ladies Bible study, I went into all the afflictions that Paul went through. And just for the sake of time, we're not going to go into that. But even for children, you can talk about who has the highs and the lows. All right. You can talk about, you know, we may never go through what Paul went through, but even for children, if they're dealing with children who are not saved with other kids, there's highs and lows in life, even for children and what they, what they deal with. And you can talk about that. Um, and you know, living, living in a sin cursed world, living in a world that doesn't adhere to God's word and what they get on TV and what they get bombarded with. And so there's, you know, highs and lows in life. Um, and then I've got a little person. It looks like a gingerbread man. All right, and then we're going to look at um, the verse Colossians 1.27, which is to whom God would make known what are the riches of his glory um, among the um, glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So this is a way to teach the children these verses visually. And like I said, you can expand on this um, and make this into a much longer curriculum when you get into explaining the words and so on. So thinking visually just takes the word. I gave you guys a worksheet that has another verse on it. 
And it's just a practice to sit down and just, you know, and everybody comes up with different ideas of just taking the words and making them either active or a game or something visual. And children will remember that. That's how I remember things the best is visual. Um, okay, now the sign, the confusing sign. Did anybody get what that says? Ages to come. Yep. You know, another great way to write material is right from your pulpit, is when a pastor is teaching and he gives an illustration, that, and, and a lot of times it's, you know, um, Alex Kurz gave, he, we were at camp, at, at the teen camp in Wisconsin, and he gave visual example after visual. He didn't have visuals, but to the teens, he was giving an example of something. I was writing as fast as I could. <laughs> And the church that I used to attend, he taught a book, and he was going through visual example after visual example. Each one of those illustrations was a lesson. So you can take that, that illustration that a pastor gives. You don't have to do the whole lesson. You just take that illustration and make a Sunday school lesson out of it. What Alex taught that, that, at that camp for that week is half of one of the Sunday school material books that, that we have. So sometimes you think, well, I can't. I'm not real good at that. Just take what a pastor's teaching, <laughs> and use it. Because it doesn't make any difference whether if you're good at it or not, you can take what somebody else has and then just put it into a form. Now, I do not proof very well. My Miss Jean Baylog, she helps me with that. You know, I mean, you, you, you all have to you just work together on things. Um, so that's how to teach visually. I have this, what I taught, in a written form. I have, it's not been proofed yet. So it's, you know, if there's mistakes, grammar and spelling and so on, just, you know. But if you want to take that and expound on it, you know, you can take that and, and make it into a month, month lesson. You can expound on it and make it into six months, put it into a curriculum and, and bring it next year. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.